I'm early to the dentist and rather than sitting in the waiting area with the radiation warnings, I'm in a nearby park. Um, it probably isn't as quiet as it could be elsewhere, but um, here I am. I'm having one of those mornings where I have to talk myself out of putting on yesterday's clothes. Just one of those big red flags for depression where you say, oh, I didn't do anything strenuous anyway. And um, I didn't feel like making the kids their usual breakfast, but I made myself shower and make something good anyway. And um, oh, <laughs> made a fairly elaborate toast for my husband. He is stuck with this rather bland, hard to make crisp, gluten-free bread that is expensive but readily available at our grocery store. And it's probably corn and rice and not too much else other than maybe seeds. And I make it in the pizza toaster and I make it toasty and then I open quail's eggs on it and then I cook those and then I add cheese and then it finishes with a piece of ham on top and he likes it <laughs> probably would like something else better but if I'm if I'm making the kids breakfast I end up doing that sometimes when I'm trying to kind of depression proof my life or get myself uh, in a better place eating I will spend the time when their breakfast is cooking to make myself a salad and either have a salad at a time of day, which I don't really want a salad, or just put it back in the refrigerator so that when I um, don't feel like preparing something, it's already prepared. I go kind of bonkers with one of my kids who um, has permission to, to get his own snack from the cupboards and I have kind of made it like a without saying so a stoplight system of, that what is easily in reach on the on the counter is yeah go for it and what is one cupboard up kind of <laughs> there is some portioning to do don't eat the whole thing and same way going up towards some things that like I would like them to ask my permission to have and if they ask and we've had a normal day's good eating then yeah probably they can have a portion of whatever it is but sometimes it's like that's mine I get to have some things that are mine and one of my guys um, who's very active I understand he has he has need for the energy but like he will eat a hundred grams of almonds he'll eat half a bag of almonds and still be looking for food and um, you know if an entire bag of raisins only lasts two days then I feel like we're not getting it right we're not calibrated and I don't want to go crazy on the message like maximum six almonds ever or whatever the reasonable little handful would be to say I had some of that and I tasted it and it was good but I'm super tired of micromanaging what everybody eats and I'm super tired of the result when I don't micromanage and I don't like the result I make a really yummy salad that has um, couscous and I like to put raisins and pistachios on it along with like I'm sort of boring in the vegetable department I really um, like my other son and would only eat palatable food if I could get away with it but you know like the romaine that doesn't rot in the fridge and lots of red peppers and cherry tomatoes and um, just I don't know whatever I can throw in a bowl that I can talk myself into to being something good I made um, the store-bought um, couscous that is in the you know prepared eat it now is like twice the portion I would want and it's super vinegary so it's kind of like it's the salad dressing and it's some extra carb in a in a salad I don't know why I'm in the park describing salad but that's where my brain is um, I am avoiding anxiety about the dentist uh, at least once with this particular dentist I have been in tears um, it is hard when they do dental work and I'm trying to say hey I'm not numb yet <laughs> don't start and they're like no you should be fine and they keep doing it and I want to say I can feel that 
stop. And I think I need a stronger stop in general in this world where I am kind of cowed by my lower language abilities. And, um, you know, the time is money. <laughs> but give me five minutes so the anesthesia works, would you? Um, some of the ways that I advocate for myself at the dentist are to make sure that I ask if they would please turn their radio off or down before we start because I really have a hard time processing what is being said to me um, with, you know, radio in Spanish or Catalan on typically quite loud, uh, piped into the room, and uh, machine noise from that thing that sucks saliva and, you know, the bumpy tool when they run stuff through your mouth. And then somebody who I think is kind of incredulous that I, I still might not totally understand open bite whatever I do understand but sometimes I'm I'm pretty in my head and pretty anxious because um, it can be quite painful and um, and I feel stupid <laughs> my last time there um, I asked for time and I closed my eyes and I got calm and he asked are you asleep and and what he meant is is your mouth numb finally but I open my eyes and it's kind of like of course not okay now I get what you mean and I have to ask for something to keep from staring into bright light and it just feels like I think I ha always had a children's dentist in the US and it was always calibrated toward reducing anxiety and, and being a peaceful space and it was less of a um, high-speed endeavor. Um, I brought my mouth guard so they can tell me if I'm grinding horribly or unevenly. I brought my health card. I'm going to be on time. I'm going to make it easier for myself than I sometimes do. Um, my, I'm sorry for the hand. I'm trying to avoid invading people's privacy who are walking very close to me. Um, my husband and I get a lot of things right, but one of the things we struggle with is keeping a family calendar together and part of it is because in the US when you have a printed calendar the first day of the week is Sunday and in Spain Catalonia when you have a printed calendar the first day of the week is Monday and so um, it happens fairly often that uh, one of us will write it down incorrectly or will communicate it correctly and you would think you know, hey, put it on your phone or put it on an electronic calendar. And sometimes we do that for things that are very important. But sometimes we just screw it up. And because I am uh, more likely to miscommunicate dates and times on the phone, I ask him to make most of my appointments and for the kids as well, because it is really frustrating to miss appointments. But I will also say that the he plans it, I go method I can't tell you how many days I've, I've been a day early at the right time or the right day at the wrong time because he has a very different and more casual kind of like, oh yeah, I think it was 10.15 and I get there and they're like, your appointment was at 9.30. And it, it feels uh, stupid and ridiculous to say, <laughs> sorry, my husband told me wrong again and I didn't double check. Um, and so... Uh, I'm trying to be on top of those things and not hold the grudge against it forever, although obviously it's on my mind every time I think about how I am American and want to be default punctual, in fact probably early to most things, and how there's a little bit of a, oh, we're on Spanish time, who cares, except for, you know, <laughs> people providing professional services who do care a lot. Um, There's uh, something I was going to mention yesterday when I, I had an off-leash dog join me on camera in, in the Quisarola. Um There's an expression, if I ever write a, a memoir or publish some short stories or just for my own uh, processing, if I ever really finish the thing I'm writing, I think the title might be No Pasare uh, or No Pasares, depending on your accent, um, which... Um, is the Catalan version of, you know, no problem. But it, it literally means like nothing happened. 
<laughs> which is sort of how I feel um, about uh, about my life here is that I am anxious and coping with things that are just nothing and to most people they're like yeah that happens to me all the time and for some reason I'm I'm stuck in my head trying to optimize it or prevent it from happening the next time or solve it and um, <laughs> even not even not being sure which version of that is the one I should say better I, I hear some people say no pasares and I hear some people say no pasare and um, I am somewhat stuck with my Norte accent I'm, I'm not trying real hard at accent correction at this point I'm trying for accuracy and to be understood most of the time but um, they're definitely in Catalan are letters that are uh, unvoiced or nearly dropped Anytime T follows N without vowels after it, for example, um, when you say nice to meet you, um, if you say tant de gust, it sounds silly, and uh, tant de gust is correct, and uh, people will, you know, <laughs> make, the, make the face that says, I'm trying not to laugh at you, I'm a good person, but they're trying not to laugh at you. And um, when um, you use infinitives, the R is dropped almost entirely. I have a strong rhotic R. I'm American. British speakers might have might have already kind of dropped their R just based on their own accents. But um, basically all infinitives that don't have an E or other, it's almost always E, but don't have a vowel following the R. There are a few that end in RE instead of um, A, R, E, R, I, R kinds of endings. Uh, those get dropped too. And I like the idea that, not that I sound great, because I know that I, I still screw up on the syntax and that I'm, I'm not an amazing speaker of Catalan, but I, I learned it by hearing it, which is uh, something that doesn't happen much in the U.S. Um, in our standard public school language classes. Like, there are recorded voices, but odds are you... you <laughs> You mostly hear your classmates speak it as badly as you do for the, the bulk of the time. And here at least, I am I am imitating my husband. Whether he has the best accent or not, or whether, you know, I am picking up mistakes my kids make that, it, that a native speaker would be training them out of, is probably some of that too. But, um, but anyway, I have started writing... Uh, <laughs> no pasares. It's kind of the fictionalized memoir, and the trouble is, it it reads like a list of grievances. You know, I've I've given change names to protect the innocent, and um, and it's the kind of thing that probably won't get published because there's a pettiness to it, there's a meanness to it, and there's the sort of underlying feminist truth of of <laughs> why are relationships this way? Why is this expected of women? Why? Uh, <laughs> why 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 um, and it's been done but I guess sometimes the devil's in the details and I get some satisfaction rather than just being mad of sitting down at the computer and composing a scene in which uh, people who are clearly identifiable as us um, get it wrong in the ways we do and, and um, there's the there's plenty of friction, but not enough conflict for a real novel. And how do you how do you end a book? You know, if I were to write a book about a decade in Catalonia, uh, I'm feeling unimaginative, uh, I think it ends when you get on a plane and go home. And I and I can't do that. I can visit, but I can't stay. It's one of the points of conflict sometimes with my mom who on Skype will say oh one of these days you'll move home and and I wonder if she realized what that sounds like to me is one of these days you'll leave him <laughs> because that's the only way I can move home is either uh, my kids are grown up or I start the long expensive you know green card visa process by which time the kids will be probably grown up anyway by the time it it would potentially go through and I watch the elections differently than other people because um, my children were born in Barcelona and um, when the xenophobic hate mongers, you know, talk about who belongs and who doesn't, 
mine belong by virtue of a law that says children born to American mothers overseas are American. And it's not a stretch for me to imagine that uh, someone racist and xenophobic might decide in the future, no, never mind. Um, you, you don't count. You have to be born on, on native soil. And it stresses me out. Um, and the idea that, you know, you could, you could put that money and time and energy and emotional investment into trying to get rights for my husband, only to have him feel like I feel, that, that it's, he's not in his home, that he, though his English is good, I, I imagine making him as unhappy on the day-to-day -day as I am on the day-to-day, -to, -day, to be out of my world, that when, when you start, it's an adventure, and people back home, I think, sometimes can't even imagine that it isn't just, you know, permanent vacation. <laughs> You're in Barcelona, but you reach a point where you rarely go more than a half hour from your house, and it's just grocery shopping, and school runs, and life, and parks, and libraries, and whatever, and it, you could be anywhere. It almost doesn't matter, except that that it's not in your operating language as the default. So when the novelty runs out, wears out, um, and it it starts to just feel hard, that connecting with people feels hard, and even when people are open and good-hearted, it, it feels superficial in a way that sometimes, um, you know, <laughs> is it is it worth it for two people with with good hearts to to try to uh, to communicate about deep things and understand each other halfway? And it doesn't work if if part of what I want is to vent and be frustrated about cultural things. You you can't. You can't get together in the park to dump on somebody's culture and expect that to go well. Uh, so usually when I find somebody I can, I can uh, <sighs> exchange, exchange with on that level, it's somebody who's also an expat and frustrated and trying to do things with English as their first language and wishing they could create circumstances for their kids that are more like home. And there's a degree of idealizing, you know, also that when you do go home or you get home, it's not quite how you imagined either. And um, so we're kind of in this, this imagined <laughs> optimal place where we could still have our spouses and multilingual children and be kind of intend to be global and things like that. Um, but... <laughs> we have to make choices I'm so lucky I have a roof over my head my partner has a stable job I have savings and kind of a golden parachute for retirement to a degree um, my kids are going to be okay and grow up and probably have fairly normal jobs doing I don't know what and um, our health isn't always 100% but we are so lucky and yet for all the times when I am anxious and frustrated and the advice is kind of <laughs> keep a gratitude journal or hey just don't worry so much don't let it get to you um, I, I, I feel kind of constitutionally incapable of doing that so that's that's the wrong way to look at it I should I should I should keep at it. Um, I think I'm going to sign off so that I'm not late to the dentist and, and uh, have as good a day as you can when you're going in for mouth pain. If you listen, thanks for listening. Hello from San Cugat. <laughs>